1985 was the best year of my life. Hi everyone, I'm George Favar. Welcome to Jack's 85. Jacksonville as it was in the year 1985. I'm pleased to bring you this show in the series of Jacksonville history shows spanning from the year 1975 through the year 1995. We've made it halfway through. We're in 1985. Back in 85, my favorite song, one of my favorite songs of all time, was We Built This City by Jefferson Starship. They'd later be known as Starship. And they had a great song. It was a big hit. But the funny thing about it is it's actually considered one of the worst songs, pop songs of all time through surveys and even the people that sang it. But what I'm going to do in this ironic thing <laughs> is I'm going to put out onto the pictures we're going to look at today selections uh, I've pulled from the song. So enjoy. You'll see the lyrics in pink. The big thing in Jacksonville in 1985 was the opening of the South Bank River Walk. You're going to see a lot of great pictures from Jacksonville in that time. Here at the San Marco Theater, The Goonies. Okay, a Steven Spielberg masterpiece. I saw it in a theater. Here we see San Marco. And boy, the movies and the music back then, so much blew my mind at the time. So let's go back to the future, shall we? We're looking at San Marco. We see the little theater in San Marco. I visited the little theater on a field trip in the 1980s. So much going on in performing arts in the 1980s in Jacksonville. You could almost say like there was a renaissance. Avondale. Notice how everything's somewhat different. Gateway Mall. Pennies. J.C. Pennies. J.C. Penny. Uh, and, and do you see on the left there Barnett Bank? Maxwell House. Some things never change. The Maxwell House plant downtown. It's amazing the things that change, but then it's amazing the new things that come along. Steinmark came along. New architecture started to appear in the 1980s. But wait, what's this? A parking lot where the Jacksonville Landing is today. Now, of course, we know the landing is set for demolition later on this year. That's the plan. But back then, the plan was to put uh, what was called a festival marketplace on the river. You could say, with all this going on, we were knee-deep in the hoopla. Uh, there is a profile done of Jacksonville uh, by the Downtown Development Authority. And they called the 1980s the billion-dollar decade. And 1985 was right in the middle of it. A boy, as a 10-year-old, riding around town with my family, I was seeing so much, and I was taking in so much. Uh, from all that I was seeing, um, the, the old train station was going to become our convention center. They, in 1985, were going to break ground on the Jacksonville Landing, and then the South Bank Riverwalk was constructed. Now there's a lot to see here. The Chart House, Sheraton. Now, if you look off in the distance, okay, look at the, 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 the JEA generating plant is still there. If you look off in the left hand corner, there's a school board building. And there's, I believe that was a restaurant. They had these nice kind of, and for the time, uh, um, overhangs. So you could step out onto the river and not be out in the sun or the rain. This is a, a plaque a, a later on, of course, obviously in 1985, this would have been a brand new plaque laid down on the Riverwalk. This show is about legacy, 
And I think all of us, well, I speak for myself and a lot of people, I think many of us can certainly thank our city's leadership. Now, <laughs> when you have politics, you're looking at politics. Back in the day, there was Ed Gamble in the Florida Times Union. And, you know, not everything was perfect. The Riverwalk had some issues because originally it was wood boards and the boards started warping. And so they, uh, they opened up the Riverwalk, but there were issues. But people, I think, were very glad to see that finally things were happening on the banks of the St. John's River downtown. And though they were just getting started, the groundbreaking of the Jacksonville Landing. We'll have a lot to say and talk about in future shows about the Jacksonville Landing. I would visit there. I believe it was in the first couple of weeks that it opened, but that wouldn't be until 1987, okay? So we'll be talking about that in Jack's 87. There's a groundbreaking in October of 1985. So this parking lot right on in front of what was at the time the Independent Life Building, now it's the Wells Fargo Center. They just keep changing those corporate names. Um, it, uh, and and the, you would see uh, that, that there was a lot going to be happening. And it's going to happen in a matter of just a couple of years. Now, there wasn't just development going on downtown. There was development out in the suburbs. This is a groundbreaking of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, here we see Mayor Godbold and other dignitaries, including Governor Bob Graham. Now, Jacksonville wasn't without issues and problems, and let's talk about them here. And Ed Gamble quite humorously displays them here. Tolls. I think everybody hated tolls. The toll booths, uh, you'd be cruising along at a really good speed, and then you'd have to come to a stop, okay? Back then, it was cash or coin, or maybe you had a JTA pass, but you still had to stop. You had to stop your car, whether you're throwing it into the basket or seeing a toll taker. Uh, there were no sun pass things where you could just keep driving. Okay, this was way back. And even Santa Claus, even Santa Claus had to go fishing for change. Uh, so <laughs> quite, a, a, quite a level of humor um, from these, these uh, political cartoons. Okay, newspapers were the big source of information in addition to television, and we'll be getting the television shortly. People were getting their news and kind of thinking about the issues, and tolls weren't going to go away as an issue. Uh, they'd been around for years, since the 1950s. Now here we have a grand jury report, it looks like, uh, JTA and the tolls, and they're trying to pour molten uh, hot uh, lava on the protesters who are shooting up arrows. Uh, can you believe it? It's those blankety blank citizens protesting again. Who do they think they're dealing with? Elected officials? And JEA is holding it, so apparently the grand jury report seems to be related to, uh, to JEA. So we have these independent authorities, but uh, trying to get a, a handle on everything. And here we have a, a leader in the 1980s, a picture of someone paying a toll. Who counts the money, un who counts the money underneath the bar? Yeah, there's a real JTA special for you. I mean, if you think about the absurdity of it, okay? The Matthews Bridge was built in the 1950s, and there you are in the 1980s, and you're still, and, and you're handing over money to people. And these dingy carbon monoxide filled toll booths. But there was, there's these grand visions of the future. And in 1985, the United States Department of Transportation, through, through the, the Urban Mass Transit Administration, bestowed upon the city $23 million. $23 million for a people mover called the Automated Skyway Express. Now, it won't come along until 1989, and this is a modern picture right here. Uh, but the money and a lot of the focus started as it came through in 1985. This has been dreamed about since the early 1970s. And there was a master plan where this would link up with suburban rail. Of course, we know where all that went. We all know what happened with all of that. And uh, there'll be more to say down the road. Now, you could say that there were some things that stunk in Jacksonville. And some of it were the paper mills, Jefferson Smurfett, uh, Union Camp. Now, you'd have the smell, but you'd also have some health effects. And 
the city of Jacksonville was not meeting the, the standards for clean air from the federal government. And it wasn't helping business. And here you can see another, another funny one. This one's from, this looks like this one though is from 1984, but I'm trying to really um, uh, show you. And speaking of showing you, Channel 4, uh, WJXT, back then had that eyewitness news format that was really neat. It was hard-hitting investigations. Now, I'm a little bit biased, I can say, and tell you that my father was a TV engineer there. I would, I would go to the news, and at 6.28 in the evening, a lot of times, I would run out from whatever I was doing to see if they scrolled Dad's name at the end when they would run the credits. Some nights they did, some nights they didn't. But I guess it kind of got me interested in the news. I used to watch the news. And uh, back then, lung cancer was a big problem. Uh, we had one of the highest lung cancer rates in the United States of America. Uh, they profiled in an investigation uh, people, and there were people that claimed that they, they were around these areas and they could feel the impacts on their lungs. These were elderly people. And this, like the tolls, these were issues that had been around for years. Since the late 40s, there had been complaints about women's nylons, for some reason, just falling apart, disintegrating, sheets that would be put out to dry, having holes in them. Uh, but the business people, some of the business people, would say, hey, it's jobs. And some, like WJXT, and my dad used to joke, the smell of money. Okay, But it's hard to sell a city, even on the river, if you've got an odor. Now, don't tell us you need us because we're the simple fools looking for America coming through your schools. Now, here is a preppy look. Bowles School, a private school off of San Jose Boulevard. Uh, now, that's the preppy look right there. And I remember back in the day, back in the 80s as a kid, I was dressed up real nice one time. And a guy, at, either it was Winn-Dix or Public, said, hey, you look like a preppy. Went, what? And, and I, I, I got it. I understood. You know, uh, these future leaders... Okay, Stanton College Prep, they graduated the first senior class of college prep kids in 1984. Okay, this is from 1985. I kind of dreamed that one day I would go to Stanton College Prep for high school, but it wasn't to be. I would graduate from Forest High School, now known as Westside High. But, you know, back then, different, different things, books, paper, notebooks, spiral notebooks, okay, they would be computers, but they would be in labs. Now, Douglas Anderson School of the Arts, another school that captured my imagination, these early magnet programs. And I envisioned Douglas Anderson School of the Arts, which opened as a magnet school in 1985 in that pro arts program, as being like the TV show of the time called Fame, the movie Fame. People dancing and painting and, and, and it, you know, I would dream about these places that I would go. And, uh, you know, it, it, Jacksonville was really working on some things. Now, we, were, we did benefit off some things in the 1960s, like the Hayden Burns Public Library, built in 1965. It was 20 years old at this point. And I would, it was really neat because, you know, right around here would be the circulation desk. Now, you see the sign says, to mezzanine? To me mezzanine. I was, wow, what's a mezzanine? I was 10 years old, and I would go to these places, and there were all these books and there are all these people, and, and when you go downtown, you have to stand somewhere. You got to, you know, you got, you got to, you know, got to be, got to mind behave. Speaking of behaving, Crown Point Elementary. Now, <laughs> Crown Point Elementary. Here's the modern picture, but uh, state of the art school, a school for the computer age. The library was cool because it had a ramp. See, you could you could walk to the if if you were good and you behaved, the teacher would say you can go ahead and take the ramp the library. If maybe things are, we're, we're not taking the ramp, we're, we're walking today. <laughs> You're just going to take the stairs. Uh, an amazing computer lab. Um, I learned basic, at least how to try to, to, to make things change on computers. Like you put in all this series of code and it might make, it would create a program that would allow the color on the screen to change from blue to red or it, there were different things. Now, I had to be very accurate. I had to be very detailed. And I, I finally, though, would get to the point in my computer classes where I could do it. And uh, I, now, <laughs> I love to read. And I guess 
we can thank James Robertson Ward for my interest in history, my early entry uh, in interest in history because of Old Hickory Town, an illustrated history of Jacksonville. The book, I believe, came out in 1982. It had gone, I think, through second publishing by 1985. I would be hauling around this book constantly. And I mean, you got to understand, I was a kid and I'm hauling around this big book and a number of big books. I, loved, I, I would just take in the reading and I loved the pictures and it would take me to a different world, a different world than, let's say, 1980s Crown Point Elementary, where you were doing math, uh, math books, and and sitting in the back of some class somewhere and writing in cursive. And you know, <laughs> uh, I was always trying to get some great books. Later on, I was always trying to get some good videos to. to um, I and I'll get down to that when we get over to R.V. Daniels and later in the 80s, but. Here, I'm with a bunch of kids and the librarian, Miss Fields. Now, I would have a book dedicated in my honor in 1985 in the Crown Point Library. Here we are in the gymnasium. Again, beautiful school. I mean, it had carpet. The Crown Point had carpet, and it, that was a basketball court. Now, I had to do square dancing, and, and we would have spelling bees. But the big thing for me was reading. The superintendent of Duval County Schools decided to have a reading program. It was called the Superintendent's Read to Succeed program. And in February 1985, there was this big monthly competition. You'd accumulate points. And, and I was sold on the idea, you get a, if you got a lot of points, you could get awards. And the legacy of my stepmother will always be her driving me <laughs> and my half-brother all the way around town to Southside Library, um, main, the main library. Um, downtown Hayden Burns. I mean, and I read. If it if it wasn't nailed down, if it was if it was available to me in <laughs> February of '85, in the spring of '85, uh, in, in that in that February of '85, and then and then from then on, uh, I I would be uh, reading uh, because remember, you know, back then, uh, you know, you you had. You could play outside, you had TV, and I watched a lot of TV and I played outside, but I loved to read. And so I got recognized by the Duval County Public School System. And I had, uh, as you saw before there, I had a uh, uh, write-up in the Times Union got to appear. Here we have Herb Sang, the Duval County Public School Superintendent from 1976 through 1989. And uh, lots of books, lots of reading, got a great joy for reading and, and the previous articles there talked about the great burst that they had of people interested, of children interested in reading in the public, uh, public libraries and in, in the public schools. And uh, so uh, thanks Herb Sang. Uh, thanks, I would say, to the people that, that um, made it happen. And here speaking of, or say you don't know me or recognize my face, but here we have behind me uh, Linda Terry on the left, my special education teacher, and the Crown Point principal, Principal Crown Point Elementary, Mildred Logan, and then my half brother in the in the uh, in the he was trying to kind of get, I think get in the picture, and it was I had this certificate the school board uh, had had given given me, and I was all dressed up, and I had gone down there with my family, and and they met me, and there's my family in 1985, 1985, the best year of my life. And then you see John W. Sutton, the school board member from our district, right there in the background at, at, on the on the dais. And and I mean, I mean, it was the biggest thing because you had to get dressed up, you had to go downtown, and you're getting these a set of encycl. I was get, I got a set of encyclopedias. I got a basketball. I got an exercise mat. Um, I um, um, you know, and you see my father, my stepmother now. Also, later on that summer, I went to see Back to the Future in one of the theaters in Jacksonville. Maybe it was Orange Park. I can't remember, but I'll never forget that movie. Uh, I mean, it really blew my mind. Robert Zemeckis' film, Michael J. Fox, who was my idol, um, uh, really liked Family Ties TV show. And boy, when he jumped in that DeLorean and he went back to 1955, the movie was incredibly intriguing, but... In 1985, while Michael J. Fox was jumping into a DeLorean, I was jumping into the Ford Fairmont station wagon. Now, this is not the actual car. It's a resemblance. And, uh, but 
Um, let's just say it was not, it was my least favorite car along with the Ford Escort. Uh, I was not big on station wagons, but there was plenty of room for me to pile up some books. Uh, and I might run around later on with my, my headphones. And, you know, you're going around town and there's some music going. Marconi plays the mamba. Listen to the radio. Don't you remember? Music would be on. I was lucky that my dad did like to listen to pop music, like to listen to rock, and we'd be once in a while listening to WAPE FM 95.1 and uh, The Big Ape. And uh, WAP was going to take me into uh, my uh, adolescence. It was great music, and Rock 105 was an experience. But attention, Kmart shoppers. Attention, Kmart shoppers. We have a special on tennis shoes for $5. Come on down. Blue light special. Tennis shoes for $5. Grab them out of the bin. I was a Kmart kid. I was a Kmart in Mandarin. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would get ribbed very severely by people by well by kids uh at crown point and some who i think also were wearing kmart clothes but that's beside the point style was everything back then but you know your parents spend on what they spend on and they spent for me they spent on a computer they spent on books they spent on movies that really captured my imagination first run movies first weekend you went to the theater you saw the movie we would have a VCR. Uh, it was a, my dad actually got beta. Uh, we actually ha had a, we would have beta. Uh, and, for, and then later on, of course, the f format changed. It, it was, became more dominated by VHS. Uh, so it was kind of a unique thing. And so we, I was able to see movies and watch things. And we had cable, Nickelodeon, the whole nine yards. So, you know, and to this day, clothing's never been my big thing. Now, also, you know, might jump in the car and be going to Win Dixie. Uh, top value stamps. They would give you. They give the, you know, when the parents would shop, you get. They hand you these stamps for when you made purchases and stuff, and you could get them ideally to redeem for prizes and for things. But they're paper. They're like stamps, like postage stamps we would have today. And uh, they were known as the Beef People. And uh, this was back when Win Dixie was big. Publix was considered. Uh, the more higher end store. Uh, now, uh, now, if you went to Winn Dixie at a certain point in 1985, you would find all of a sudden that Coke, Coca Cola had changed uh, their formula to New Coke. And boy, I do hope that this show is more popular than uh, New Coke was because <laughs> New Coke was not very popular. It was very unpopular. And I remember drinking it and going, like, what? <laughs> Nope, nope. Uh, and, you know, I remember my grandfather would, with the classic, we now know as classic Coke, and that was back when it, you could give him in bottles. The, the bottles he would have would be taller, and he would it'd be ice cold, and he would pour into um, a, a glass filled with butter pecan ice cream. We would have these, these, uh, these floats, soda floats. Um, really, wow. And it would hit the spot. A cold Coca-Cola, not new Coke, a cold Coca-Cola <laughs> would definitely hit the spot on a very hot day. Now, they eventually, it took them a month or two or however it worked out, but they came to their senses and they introduced, brought back Coca-Cola Classic. And new Coke phased, phased out. And Now, the Mayport Ferry, my dad would always try to get us into the car to go out different place. We'd go to St. Augustine, we'd go to Mayport. Here, we see the Mayport Ferry, and this is how I remember it. Look at the pirate. Um, look at the pirate uh, sign, the pirate painting there. That really... You, when you got on the Mayport Ferry in the 80s, and especially if you're a kid, okay, and that's the Blackbeard, you're like, wow, I'm getting on this, this boat. <laughs> I'm getting on this big boat, and I'm going to go across this way. And like it really, and, and I remember not that I don't know about a good while back. Uh, I still I still had enjoyed uh, when I could going on to the Mayport Ferry. Now I also sold a lot of Scout World tickets. Uh, I sold like in front of the Eckerd's in Mandarin off of uh, San Jose, and uh, Eckerd Drugs. Remember Eckerd's? Okay, so I was selling tickets for Scout World, big event at. Uh, NAS Jacks. And 1985 was the 75th anniversary of scouting. And there was this big 
uh, dinner uh, at uh, at the Moose Lodge and uh, got prize for coolest cake and made the cake with my father. Okay, you two, yeah, the band you two. Now these people, these British guys, were amazing, and they performed in Jacksonville. Of course, I was ten years old, so I didn't get to go. But later on, I'd hear their music. Now you can go on to YouTube as of in 2019, you can pull up uh, footage, sound footage, just sound footage of the concert. And if you listen to Sunday Bloody Sunday and Pride in the Name of Love, those two, um, and it, I mean, it'll stir you. I mean, I, I, I was 10 years old, okay? In a year or two, I was going to get a set of headphones and I was going to be able to hear this amazing music, okay? I was going to be able to hear this amazing music. Now, if jazz was your thing back in 1985, you could enjoy Tito Puente at the Jacksonville Jazz Festival. Now, in 1985, there was a bad drought in Africa, and there were these African children, and they were starving, and they were starving very brutally, and I remember seeing it on my kitchen television. Well, one day I went out, turned on the kitchen television, and there were all these people performing at Live Aid, and there was also We Are the World. Okay, there were these different concerts where singers would gather together to raise money. Um, Willie Nelson later on, would, I believe somewhere around this time, did Farm Aid, okay? These are the people I heard on the radio. Now, we've taken quite a journey, and I'll have more to bring you in Jax 86. We'll talk about the convention center uh, that will be um, opening in 86 at uh, what was then uh, the old abandoned Union uh, Station, Jacksonville Terminal. And, uh, and see the old Acosta Bridge uh, uh, back there in the distance. I'll also be talking a lot with you about Mandarin and about uh, the feed store. I've got a lot to tell you all about. Thanks for watching. Take it easy. See you later.